Take your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 16, if you don't mind. And if you do mind, why'd you come to church? Genesis chapter <clears throat> 16, and then we're going to get into 17. I need to sink. If you give me a minute, I need to sink my tablet here with the box there on the screen. Press that button. It did what it's supposed to. It's starting to work a little bit better than it was a couple years ago. A couple years ago, kept having problems, and somebody who's supposed to write the code for all of this probably came in a little hungover one day and just wrote stuff down on a computer and said, here you go, boss, this works. And it just didn't, this didn't quite work that way. Yeah, we're in the right place. There we go. Genesis chapter 16. Good to be here tonight. Good to be alive. Good to be breathing the Lord's air. Good to be living the Lord's life. I wouldn't, I wouldn't live another life. I wouldn't live another life. Somebody I know, they uh, do catering for wealthy people and their parties. And the stories that I hear, I wouldn't live that life for all the tea in China. I, there's no way in the world I would live that life. Um, the drinking every, every week every weekend especially. One particular party they had was a wedding party. The um, banquet company that managed the banquet had to make a total of four different trips to buy more alcohol. The last time they just simply refused. They said, we're not buying anymore. Somebody whipped out a big wad of cash and they said, well, will this change your mind? They said, yeah. And they went and bought it for them. And then after that, they said, we just, we can't do no more. And um, some, some of them were saying, hey, I know of a place that's still open. Let's go there when we leave here. Now, that may have been your life before you got saved, but I, I just never did get into that life. My dad, my dad drank beer. Um, I never really saw him drink hard liquor. I never saw him drunk ever a day in his life. But he was hooked I guess you could say casually on beer. He liked 905 beer. If you remember that from back then in those days, there was a cheap brewery around that made 905 beer and that was his favorite. And uh, he would drink a lot of that. And, um, but anyway, he said, if the Lord hadn't delivered me from that, he said, I'd be a dead man and he knew it. But to live that kind of lifestyle and to have that kind of... Um, to have that kind of life, I, I never really desired it, thank God. I never really wanted anything to do with it. Uh, my dad did give me a couple of drinks of beer when I was a young boy. We'd be out fishing, I'd be thirsty, and he'd give me a little swig of it. That was just not something that I, I would rather drink water out of the Mississippi River than drink beer, and did. So um, that kind of life, I guess some people like it. I guess it's what they like to do. I don't know, but that's, that's not for me. So I'm glad God did not deliver me over to that. I'm glad he's not turned me over to that. I'm glad he's not turned me over to a lot of things. Somebody say amen. I'm glad, I mean, I'm not saying I'm an angel by any stretch of the imagination. But the things that God has kept me from um, are far, far greater than the things that God allowed me to do. And for that, I'm very thankful. Genesis chapter 16. The Bible says this. We'll read a few verses. We'll go to prayer. Now Sarai, 
and I'm going to say it this way for another chapter. Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And this is the, this is the, um, the chapter where they made the big mistake. In fact, this mistake now has carried on throughout history and has created more wars, caused more deaths at the hands of other men than probably any other issue in the world. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. She had in handmaid an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. And Hagar said, and Sarai said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, it, it would be like, and just to, just to be blunt, but it would be like if you let your wife hire someone to watch the, you know, watch over the house and clean the house and do the laundry and everything like that. And, and uh, your wife always wanted a baby and she knew that she was barren, couldn't produce a child. So it'd be like your wife saying, hey, this gal here, well, won't you, uh, she's agreed to let us have a child through her, which is legal, it's called surrogacy, and she's, she's agreed now to allow you to go in unto her, bring forth seed, bring forth the child, the child will be ours, and, and maybe that's how it's going to be done. Now, something, let's pray and then we'll get into this. Father, I ask your blessings on your word. There's a lot of things on my mind and my heart tonight. Pray, Lord, that you'd help me. Lord, just give us grace and give us understanding of your word. We love you and we thank you for all that you do and will continue to do. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. So it be about like that kind of situation there where your wife told you, okay, she's yours for however long it takes. You can go in under her till she produces a child. We've signed a contract. She's going to be the surrogate mother and so on. As soon as the child's born, she's going to be ours, and that's going to be it. Now, something that I, I want to just bring your attention to, don't want to be offensive in any way, uh, I did not write the Bible. I did not create his doctrines. I did not create man and woman, child. I did not create all of those things. I didn't decide who was going to be the stronger vessel or the weaker vessel. I had nothing to do with that. God is the one who did that. But obviously what Sarah told Abram was wrong. Obviously it was wrong it was dead wrong. It was a hundred thousand million miles off from what God intended. And if there's a le and and I, I always look at it from a typological standpoint, the man, especially if it's a good guy in the Bible, like Paul was, or in this case Abram was, or Moses was, or Adam, or whatever. If it's a good guy in the Bible, he's going to represent Jesus Christ. He's going to represent God in some way. He's going to represent Jesus Christ in some way. And God's going to bless him and use him that way. When God made the proclamation that no one was to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam believed what God said. Adam believed it. He abided by it. He stuck with it. He never went near that tree, had nothing to do with it. And Adam did not partake of that until his wife came. Now, when his wife came and the devil went to one of the two, the devil knew which one to go to. He knew to go to Eve. 
The Bible tells us that the woman is the weaker vessel. There is a reason why there are no women who have written any part of the Bible. There is a reason why there are no women apostles. There's no reason we're not, there's a reason why we're not following the 12 tribes named after the 12 daughters of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's a reason why out of 40 men who wrote the Bible, all of them were men. There's a reason why bishops must be the husband of one wife, meaning he must be a man, so on and so on and so on. And, and Paul explains it. The wife being the weaker vessel. The devil will use and mess her up and then she will alter the, out, the intended outcome of everything that God is trying to do. God made it very, very clear in no uncertain terms that it was going to be Abram and it was going to be through Sarah that God would do this thing or Sarai and God was going to do this thing. But it was Sarai who, it was Eve who got it wrong and it was Sarai who got it wrong. Okay? And thus we have a problem. And there, you can go story after story after story. Now, there's, there's places in the Bible where the woman was actually more right than the man was. I'm thinking of the case of the book of Esther. When it came time to give counsel to King Mordecai, when Mordecai listened to Esther, he saved all of the Jews and the city rejoiced. When King, it's not, not Mordecai, it's Ahasuerus. When King Ahasuerus listened to Haman, he was in really, really bad trouble. But in this case here, Sarai began to think independently of what God said. In other words, she went and stepped outside of the bounds of God's word and said, maybe God means this. The Bible tells us that there is no prophecy of scripture that is of any private interpretation and that is exactly what Sarai did. She privately interpreted what she thought God may have meant and it's caused trouble on this earth since that time. It's caused problems on the earth. So in verse 3, in Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went in unto her, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. It immediately caused problems. Immediately, it caused problems. God knew it would. This is why God didn't say, I want it to be done this way, because God knew it would cause problems. So verse 5, And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. She is confessing. She is repenting. I believe God's going to forgive her. I have given my maid into thy bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived... I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. And see, here's what it is. Hagar represents, we know that she represents the Jews in Galatians chapter 4. But she also represents the pride of the religious world. Who thinks because they have done and performed more than those who have simply waited on the Lord, they look down upon us with pride and conceit. Years ago, Megan, we had a Christian school here, and at the beginning of it, we had quite a few students here. We had about 65 kids here at one point when we first started out. And we had a group of women that brought their kids over, from a charismatic church, and they were all followers of Joyce Myers and Rodney Howard Brown. And Rodney Howard Brown was going to be in town. And these women came over, and what they wanted to do is they wanted to, they wanted to try to kind of take over 
what was going on here. And I sensed it pretty early. And the first thing they did was, they said, Pastor, can we pray with you? I said, yeah, and I needed prayer at the time, so I let them pray with me. And I heard a few tongues and this and that and the other, and I was not very comfortable with it at all. And then they said, now, Rodney Howard Brown is coming to this area. In fact, we would like for you to come. We can get you in. And they said, a lot of you people have come to these things. Very condescending. In other words, it would be like a white guy inviting a black guy to a party. We've had a lot of your kind come and fit in. It'd be kind, it was kind of like that. A lot of your guys have come and fit in very well. And I said, I just, I'm not going to that. I don't believe in it, and I'm not falling for it. But they were trying to use that influence to control what was going on in this school. And I didn't care for it one bit in the world. So now Hagar and Ishmael, Hagar especially, is going to try to use this to use it as a place of influence to where Sarah no longer matters. Sarah's getting to be an old lady. We don't have to listen to her. I'm much younger than she is. Maybe, maybe who knows, maybe Abram will like me better than her and end up being with me more than he will be her. And I'll be like his, her sister wife or whatever they call that. I'll, I'll be the number one wife instead of the number two wife. Something like that was going on. And uh, so she said, um, verse 7, The angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of Sur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence comest thou? Whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said, said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child. Thou shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael. And I want you to notice, God's name is in his name, El. We have Israel, and we have Ishmael. They both bear God's name in their name. And he said, um, shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she shall be called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, thou God seest me. For she said, have I also here looked after him that seeth me. Wherefore, the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Barad. Now, I, I'm, I'm, going, I'm just giving you a little bit of what I believe. I do believe that in last day's events, not something that's going to happen now, not something that's going to happen right away, but I do believe that these sons of Ishmael, God is going to bless them. They are a seed of Abraham. God is going to bless them, and I believe he's going to bless them with salvation. I believe they're going to leave Allah, and I believe that they're going to know Jehovah. Uh, verse 15, Hagar bare Abram a son, Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare Ishmael. And Abram was four score six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to him. How is four score and six? How old is that? 86 years old, okay? And he ended up 86 in both of them. That's a joke. He did, he just put them out. Now, uh, chapter 17. This is a different chapter. This has a different meaning to it. The number 17 
is the number for transformation. It is the number for change. It's the number for you know, transformation, change, alteration, uh, and not in a small way either. In the, in the biggest way possible. And I'll show you that in the scriptures. In verse 1, Abram is about to be changed. And I want you to notice, I want you to notice the progress here. Does he have Ishmael before or after his name is changed to Abraham? Before. There's a reason for that. It is God saying, I will not choose Ishmael. He is a child of bondage and he is a child of a different man, Avram. Israel, however, is a child of a different man, Avraham. And I'm going to show you that in the scriptures. Genesis 17, verse 1, when Abram was 90 years old and 9. What is that like? 33 times 3? Think about that for a minute. 33 times 3. Okay? When he was 90 years old and 9, or think, you can think of it like this. 9 is a number for fruit bearing. It took... Uh, Sarah was 90. She bore Isaac... Uh, nine months. So you could look at it that way as well. But there was, a ti uh, there was a timing for this. And it's something that I probably don't teach enough. I probably should teach more. And that is God is a God of order. He's a God of numbers. He's a God of, I'm going to do it on this date. Not this date and not this date, but this date. And I'm going to do it at this time. It's not going to be a minute early and it's not going to be a minute late. It's going to be at the exact time that I want it to be because I believe that everything that God does is in a perfect order. And the more you learn about God, the more you can understand that order. I do not believe that if you study everything you can ever find in the Bible about God's order, that you'll be the one to figure out the day of the Lord's appearing in the air. I don't believe that. Uh, in fact, I quit doing it a long time ago. <laughs> okay, like 20 some odd years ago. I, I just quit. I, I, I was doing it at first, I will admit. But finally God said, Mike... Just leave it alone. I'm not going to tell it to you anyway. So just quit studying, quit looking for it, quit, quit trying to be the first guy to find it. Don't worry about that stuff, okay? So I quit. I just give up. People say, you think the Lord's coming this year? I, I don't know. Couldn't care less, to be honest with you. He'll come when he's ready to come. So when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am, the all, I am the almighty God, walk before me and notice this now, be thou perfect. Now God is saying something to Abram, I don't think he's ever said before. As of this point, Abram, you're perfect. In other words, I have sanctified you, past tense sanctified you. Meaning that I've washed away sins that you haven't even thought of committing yet. I've sanctified you. I've perfected you. I'm the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Verse 2. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying... As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Now look at verse 5, because 
I'm telling you, you write this down somewhere. The number, and if I had 17 fingers, I'd hold them up. Flip. 17 and 5 go together. Lots of times. Okay? So, Genesis 17, 17th chapter of the Bible, verse 5. God says this, Neither shall thy name be any more called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Now, what in the world is the difference, a big deal difference between Abram and Abraham? Excuse me, my name is not Charlie, it's Charlie. We always look at somebody like that going, sure thing, Chuck, whatever you want. Okay, but it was a big deal. It was a huge deal that God has just done here. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Now, uh, turn to Psalm 119 verse 33. In Psalm 119, all of the Hebrew letters are listed. And that's because in Psalm 119, there is a, it's sort of like a Hebrew play on letters. The first letter of the first word of verse 1 is the Hebrew letter Alpha. Aleph or Aleph which is like A in verse 9 you go 8 verses in the verse 9 in Hebrew the first letter of the first word in Hebrew in that verse is Bet which is the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet in verse let's see 8, 16. In verse 17, the first word and the first letter, Alpha, Beth, Daleth, the first word starts with the letter Daleth, which is the third letter of the Hebrew, Aleph, Bet. Eight more verses down, the first word starts with the letter Gimel which is the fourth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it does that in every eight verses. Eight verses, the first letter, the first word, starts with the very next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It also does that in Lamentations. If you look at Lamentations very quickly, look at Lamentations. To say men wrote the Bible... Only stupid men believe men wrote the Bible. Because if they actually knew what was in here, they would say, there's no way men could have done that. That's a good point. Jer right after Jeremiah, turn to Jeremiah. Turn to Lamentations, which is right after Jeremiah. And I want you to notice in Lamentations, Lamentations chapter 1 how many verses does it have in it? 22. 22. That's how many letters there are in the Hebrew alphabet. And the reason is, is because verse 1 of Lamentations, in, in Hebrew, the first letter is Aleph. In verse 2, in Hebrew of Lamentations, the first letter of the first word is Beth. In verse 3, it's Gimel. In verse 4, it's Daleth. In verse 5, it's Hay. And it, and it does that in chapters 1, does it in chapter 2. Now, look at chapter 3. Chapter 3 does not have 22 
verses in it. How many verses does it have in it? 66. So, guess how the pattern is split up. Every third verse, you have, on verse 1 of chapter 3, you have Aleph. On verse 4 of chapter 3, you have Beth. On verse one, two, three, four, five, six, you have Alpha Bale. Ba, I, I, know, I know my Greek letters better than my Hebrew letters. Uh, Aleph, Beth, Daleth, Gimel, and so on. It does that every three verses. Okay? And then back in uh, chapters 5, 4 and 5, it goes back to the beginning of every uh, word is is alphabetical order. Okay? In Hebrew. Now, that I've showed you that, let's read Psalm 119. Let's read the letter that God added to Abram's name. His name was Ab Avram. But now it's Avraham. Okay? Psalm 119, verse 33. And it tells you, hey, and it tells you what it looks like in Hebrew. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments. For therein do I delight. Incline mine heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity and quicken thou me in thy way. Establish thy word unto thy servant who is devoted to thy fear. Turn away my reproach which I fear for thy judgments are good. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Now, if you were to just take these verses and apply it to Abraham's life as of right this minute, you can see what it is that makes Abraham a brand new person. He's not just been transformed by giving him a, an added letter to his name or a new name. He has been transformed because now he does not abide in covetousness. He couldn't care less about what he has. He knows that God has quickened him. He knows that God established his word unto his servant. And he knows that he longs now after God's precepts. And instead of listening to his wife, give him wrong advice, he's going to listen to God from here on out. That's pretty good stuff, okay? You can do stuff like that all day long with the Bible, okay? But that's the letter that he added to Abram's name. And by the way, the hey letter is one of the few Hebrew letters that has breath in it. You see, we don't close the lips, the teeth, the tongue, or the throat when we say Abraham. We let the breath, the spirit out, and that's exactly what God did. The spirit now is coming out of Abraham. What did Jesus do when he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost? What did he do to him? He went, hey guys. Well, I don't think he did the hey guys part. <laughs> but he went, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Okay? Now I'm not dear done. Here's the Hebrew Aleph Bet. And it is mostly consonants. Which means the mouth is stopped 
somehow, some way, like the letter P, Q, S, T, B, M, N, Z, so on. Those are all consonants, which means I can't let all of the air out of my lungs, out of my mouth. I have to stop the air somehow to shape the air to make the consonant, like the letter T or P or M. M closes it off completely. M, N, L. L closes it off with the tongue. There's names for it, glottal things. There's other names for it. I won't get into all that. But the way that God designed the Hebrew Aleph Bet is that practically every letter is a consonant, which means the mouth gets stopped. Notice Romans 3.19. Now we know what, that what things soever the law saith, the law is always the Old Testament, written in what language? What language was the Old Testament written in? Hebrew. Now we know that whatsoever things the Hebrew law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Doesn't matter what Hebrew word it is. The mouth in pronouncing the Hebrew words is going to be stopped by its own letters. Now, the only exception, there's one, one exception to this. And it's the very first letter in Hebrew, which is this one. And it's, Aleph or Aleph. Now we would say, well, that's the letter A, and A is a breath. It's a vowel, right? It's a breath sound. But did you know that the letter Aleph in almost every Hebrew word is never pronounced? It's never pronounced. It's like having a B in the word subtle. It's there, but you'll never use it. Huh? It is very subtle. Okay? All right. Now, let me show you Greek, the Greek alphabet, the difference. God obviously did something for a reason. He said in Isaiah 28, 11, he said, with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Stammering lips is Moses. Moses is always the Old Testament. He represents the law. And Moses stammers. He stutters. He's hard of speech, the Bible says. And when he questions God, God, why are you sending me to go speak to Pharaoh when I obviously can't speak? What do you think you're doing? So God said, fine, I'll send Aaron to speak for you. But it's going to cost you. So Aaron went to speak for Moses because Moses stuttered. And the whole point of Moses stuttering was so that the Israelites would have a un hard understanding, understanding the law and what it was saying. Okay, so God said, with stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to this people. Old Testament, Hebrew. But then when he starts writing the New Testament, he's changed the language. After 400 years, from Malachi to Matthew, now nobody's speaking Hebrew. Everybody's speaking Greek. And Greek's different. You see the, the, the letters I have up here that are in green? Alpha, Epsilon, Heta, Heota, Omicron, Hoopsalon, 
and omega, they're all vowels. That means they all have nothing that stops them. They're like A-E-I-O-U in English. There's nothing that stops them from coming out. The mouth is not stopped. The breath, the spirit is allowed to come out freely. How many of them are there up there? Seven! They represent the seven spirits of God. So Greek alphabet contains seven vowels, all breath, mouth open. Revelation 5, 6, I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and one of, one of the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as had it been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And while, yes, the Hebrew Old Testament was written for the Jews, by the time Jesus comes around, Paul comes around, John comes around, most of the known world can speak Greek. And everybody's going to be able to read and hear and understand what the gospel says. Like now. The reason why I can have two radio stations in Kenya is that they know English. Because 200 years ago, the British sent trade ships over there, colonized eastern, Ken eastern Africa, gave them tea, gave them soccer balls, gave them cro croquet, gave them uh, cricket, and gave them English Bibles to read. Okay? God did that for those people. And I believe that with all my heart. So it matters. It matters. John 20, verse 22. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not the letter, which is the Old Testament, written in Hebrew. Remember, the letter stops the air from coming out of the mouth. Not the letter, but the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The letter being stopped, stopping the air coming out. I mean, if you were giving someone mouth, like if I had passed out this morning because of what I was going to preach, and Matthew came up to save my life, and as he put his mouth over mine, he stuck his tongue over it and went... Mom, am I in Dad's will? Yeah, I think you are. <laughs> oh, he's not breathing. Sorry. I could go on stuff like this all day. Sarai. But Sarah. And now Sarah, who's not given birth yet, now she can give birth. Now she can give birth to the child of life, the child of promise. But she couldn't do it before that. She didn't have what was needed. Now that she has what was needed, the breath, now she can bring the child of promise into this world. And God's going to do exactly that. I love, I love stuff like this. I love the Bible. To me, this stuff makes it neat. neat. It's like this morning I gave you ham and sausage and mashed potatoes and corned beans and bread. And now I'm giving you chocolate pie. Or coconut cream pie or whatever kind of pie you like. Let's stand to our feet. Father, give us life. Father, you translated. I like this, God. You translated the Hebrew for us into our language that has breath in it. So the letter no longer kills us. It gives us life. 
We can now find Jesus just as easily in the Old Testament as we can in the New Testament because he's there. Because you've breathed into us the breath of life. And we see it. And we speak life to people. And they understand it. They need to be saved by it. And I pray God that you would do that. Bless and honor your word. I love you. I thank you God for giving us dessert. Making this Bible rich for us making it good for us. Thank you, God, for enriching our lives with it, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.